In early 1944, SOE offered Christine Granville a job, but this time not in occupied Poland, but in a hidden corner of the south of France, the Vercors. It's a land of rough terrain and high limestone plateau. It's difficult enough getting around now, but 70 years ago, these roads were almost impenetrable. Not surprisingly, the occupying Germans found them impossible. So the Vert Corps became one of the most celebrated strongholds of the French resistance, the Maquis, who used the secret mountain paths, the dense forests and deep caves and ravines to come and go at will. It was ideal because um, the land approaches were roads, narrow roads coming up through, through gullies and, and, and valleys. You could watch and see where the German troops were coming up them. You could potentially ambush them. On the plateau itself, you had an open area. You could take deliveries of, of parachuted supplies and so on. And in fact, Vercors itself set up the, the Free Republic. The farther north we moved, the more German resistance stiffened. But the FFI was organizing on a larger scale than ever before. And from the farms and towns, French men and women were forming scouting patrols and regular rifle companies. And it was very exciting. It was, they, they had become, they had self-liberated themselves. And central to this liberation was an Englishman. Francis Kermertz was perhaps the most outstanding SOE operative working out of occupied France. Born in London in 1915 to a Belgian father, Kermertz was a pacifist until the death of his brother produced a change of heart. He volunteered to fight, and his intelligence and fluency in French made him a prime candidate for SOE. Although his height, he was six foot four, made him hardly an inconspicuous spy. SOE had a real problem in the south of France. Many of its agents had been caught or betrayed by collaborators. Most had been tortured, and entire networks and circuits had been compromised. The British knew they had to do something drastic. We must assume that the whole of the organization that they built up is blown and send out a new organizer and wireless operator as soon as possible to get that area going again. Kermertz was the man chosen. When he was parachuted into France in the autumn of 1942, he soon realized it was far too dangerous to rely on the old contacts. He had to start again and build his own network who he could absolutely rely upon. He had one very good rule for a head of circuit. Never to sleep two nights in the same bed, kept constantly on the move. And an even better rule, nobody, nobody at all, knew where he was going to sleep. He had two circuits in parallel, a fighting circuit and a sleeping circuit. And the sleeping circuit was a series of safe houses in which he could go to sleep knowing that nobody would know where he was. This, this f from a security point of view, is an admirable arrangement. I don't know of any other agent who attempted it, but it's a very good system. He travelled all the time by public transport or by bicycle under the disguise of a sick, retired teacher, as he recalled in this interview a few years before his death in 2006. I got out of a train at Avignon station and there was a rather heavy control. And uh, they were spending a lot of time looking at my papers. I coughed and spluttered, bit my lip and spat blood on the platform. My papers were returned very quickly and I was sent on my way. I didn't say I've got TB or anything like that. By the start of 1944, he had survived far longer than most other SOE agents in France and had set up his own circuit of several thousand French men and women all involved in sabotage against the Germans. But he'd had a serious setback. His Irish assistant had been captured by the Germans. She would subsequently die in the gas chambers. Kermertz needed a replacement urgently. SOE 
had just the woman. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Why don't think you two have met? Captain Brown and Miss Williams. How do you do? Christine was given the identity of Pauline Armand, a French noblewoman who had fallen on hard times. And then complete with revolver and cyanide pill, she was parachuted into the Vercors. It's difficult now to appreciate what risks agents like Christine were taking. By 1944, a hundred British SOE agents had been captured in France. Almost all were tortured. One method was to immerse them in water until they almost drowned. Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, said that the British spies should only be allowed to die after they had been tortured to the point of revealing everything they knew. One British spy who was captured by the Germans remembers the experience vividly even 50 years later. He survived, but only just. The beating usually started with a slap in the face. And then it went down. It was meant to break you physically and morally at the same time. This is what Christine was risking, and she didn't give it a moment's thought. She was exactly what Kermertz needed. His main job was to recruit people and keep their spirits up, and Christine helped enormously. She exuded a subtle, delicate charm and created a climate of friendship so rapidly that people felt they'd known her forever. Her courage, reliability, and appreciation of detail ensured that she was trusted by resistance groups across the south of France who became not just her allies, but her friends. Her role, though, wasn't just supportive. One of the fascinating things about Christina was she realized that the German garrisons in occupied France were composed in many cases of former prisoners of war captured on the Eastern Front um, and then recruited in the German army and they were called Ostbattalion or Ostlegion. And these troops were, basically they joined the German army because otherwise they wouldn't have survived in the prison war camps. Several people attempted to get the Osttruppen, to whom the Germans had thousands in France to change sides. I had a friend in SAS who uh, tried to do what he could with, with the Russians and Georgians in Brittany without much success. And she reckoned it was worth putting pressure on them because to say, look, you've got to get out of the German army because you are now on the losing side. Christine made contact with many Ostbattalion troops. She managed to persuade hundreds of them to change sides. In one small village alone, she was responsible for the defection of an entire garrison of conscripted Polish troops from the German army to the Maquis, complete with ammunition, supplies, and German prisoners. And it wasn't just Poles she worked with, but Serbians, Czechs, Russians, and Italians. Christine became a recruiting officer for many Italian units who had turned against Germany. 